Greetings. This lecture is on the War of 1812. The War of 1812 was a senseless war. Wise diplomacy was lacking to prevent the loss of lives and widespread destruction in the Canadas and the United States. It is difficult to point to either the United States or Great Britain as the victor. Both nations experienced victories and costly defeats. There is less ambiguity concerning the people of British North America. Canadians won much in the sense of a psychological boost. The War of 1812 was another important step on the road to Canadian nationalism. The origin of the North American War that took place from 1812 to 1815 was the ongoing conflict in Europe. The Napoleonic Wars that began in 1799 and lasted for years had Great Britain and France establishing policies that offended Americans. The bitter enemies of Great Britain and France adopted measures to cripple each other's trade on the seas. The British response to Napoleon Bonaparte's blockage of shipping was to enforce neutral ships i.e. American ships, to obtain a license to operate on the high seas. American sailors experienced ill treatment from the British who boarded ships that they suspected of carrying contraband. The British also stopped American ships to look for deserters of the Royal Navy. Even worse was when the British apprehended American sailors to serve in the British Navy. Although the British did not claim the right to seize American citizens, it did occur to thousands of Americans. One emotional incident was the Chesapeake episode of 1807 when four British fugitives who deserted the Navy enlisted on the USS Chesapeake, an American frigate. The British confronted the craft 10 miles off the coast of Virginia and requested agreement to search the ship. When the American captain refused, the British fired on the ship, killing three and wounded many others. After the British grabbed the deserters, the Chesapeake returned to land. The American public was furious, wanting revenge. Seeking to avoid war, President Thomas Jefferson demanded reparations and the end of impressment tactics that seized American sailors. The British balked on the latter and Jefferson chose economic coercion. The Embargo Act of 1807 virtually prohibited the export of any goods from the United States by sea or by land. This turned out to be a self-crucifying embargo that was not well received in the New England states and New York. In fact, the embargo caused an economic depression in 1808. James Madison became president in 1809, but his arrival did not diminish anti-British sentiment. Congress approved uh, Macon Bills number two which permitted commerce with England and France. The catch was that only one would benefit, depending on who repealed its offensive decrees first. The French cleverly pushed the Americans to oppose British. The Americans had other grievances. There was the issue of Indian violence on the Northwest frontier where native warriors attacked Americans. The Indian leader Tecumseh was successful in leading a coalition of natives that supposedly received British weapons to cause havoc to American pioneer life. On June 18th, 1812, the Americans declared war on Britain. Officials in Canada feared that the immigration of Americans to Canada in recent years represented a guerrilla-type movement where Americans would gain control in Canada. These fears were groundless, since the American families that settled in Canada were mostly apolitical. 
both officials in Canada and the United States got the issue of loyalty wrong. American leaders had incorrectly assumed that most other Canadians had little loyalty for the British. American leaders believed that the Canadas were a vital possession for the British and thus capturing the Canadas would force the British to negotiate her trade policies and stop ill treatment of American ships. Madison, Thomas Jefferson and others were confident that the taking of Canada was a mere matter of marching. They saw that Great Britain had its hands full with Bonaparte's militarism. The Americans were guilty of overconfidence. America lacked the necessary number of trained and armed soldiers to score any easy victory of the Canadas. President Madison was a gifted writer who was the main author of the Constitution of the United States, but he lacked competence on military matters. Any chance of reasonable diplomacy between the British and Americans diminished when a deranged man shot and killed Prime Minister Spencer Percival. This took place in the lobby of the House of Commons on May 11, 1812. Due to the distraction of installing a new prime minister, the plan of Britain easing its tough policy on American shipping came too late. As for American leaders, Madison pushed for a declaration of war, even though one third of Congress opposed. He did so without strong public support for the war. Of the American people supportive of the war, many expected that most Canadians secretly desired to join the United States. By European standards, the War of 1812 was relatively unimportant. For Upper Canada, however, it was a fight for survival. U.S. military leaders were confident of their invasion plan. The Americans outnumbered the British, so they expected an easy victory. Their military strategy was to hit the British in both Upper and Lower Canada. One objective was to sever the Canadian supply line along the St. Lawrence River. However, the Americans did not experience much success in the initial stage of the conflict. They first attacked near Detroit, but this had little effect on the supply line that stretched to the east. The Americans also faced the formidable, formidable military leader, General Isaac Brock. The British were fortunate to have a great general to defend Canada. In the years leading up to the war, Brock had strengthened British fortifications, improved naval operations on the Great Lakes, established intensive military training, and developed stronger relations with native warriors. All this did much to boost the confidence of Canadians. When American General William Hall attacked the British in the Detroit area, Brock fooled the Americans by marching his men in a manner that gave the impression of large numbers of trained men. Tecumseh's native fighters added to the ruse by uttering blood-curdling war cries. Brock sent Hall a warning message. It is far from my inclination to join in a war of extermination, but you must be aware that the numerous body of Indians who have attached themselves to my troops will be beyond my control the moment the contest commences. There was a history of Indians annihilating large numbers without any consideration to the European idea of honorable surrender. While Hall considered his options, native warriors attacked Fort Dearborn in what is today Chicago and killed everyone in the garrison. On August 16th, Hall surrendered to the British to the disgust of American leaders. Although Hall received a court-martial and a sentence to die for his cowardice, his Revolutionary War record saved him and a sentence was reduced to a dishonorable discharge. The next major engagement was in October 1812, when the Americans, led by General Stephen Van Rensselaer, 
attempted to cross the Niagara River. The British were victorious at the Battle of Queenston Heights, but General Brock died in action. Reinforcements had made a difference for the British in the fact that several thousand New York militia refused to continue fighting. The New York reservists declared their willingness to defend their homes, but to not to fight on Canadian soil. Other American attempts to cross the Niagara River were unsuccessful. The Americans' next initiative was north to Montreal, but New York reservists once again opposed entering Canada. The British decision not to have the Navy blockade New York and other American ports in 1812 and 1813 might have kept American opposition to the war intact. New York was one state with less enthusiasm for the war. One notable story concerned a housewife named Laura Secord. In June 1813, the 38-year-old woman overheard a conversation between two American soldiers that revealed an American surprise attack on a British outpost nearby. Because Americans guarded the roads, Laura cautiously set off to warn the British commander approximately 20 miles away. All day she walked, following deserted paths through the forest and crossing creeks on fallen logs. She encountered an Indian camp and natives led her to the British. On June 24th, 1812, 400 Mohawks and a small number of British soldiers ambushed and defeated the Americans at the Battle of Beaver Dams. With a slate of new generals, the Americans had greater success in 1813. General William Henry Harrison led a force that regained Detroit. Harrison also scored victories in Ohio at Fort Meech in May and Fort Stevenson in August. In September, the Americans were victorious at the Battle of Moravian Town, also known as the Battle of Thames, in Upper Canada, where they killed Tecumseh. At Fort Erie in September, the Americans scored a naval victory and the victorious captain sent a message to President Madison, quote, we have met the enemy and he is ours. Once again, American forces attempted a Niagara crossing and this time they were successful. They continued crossing Lake Ontario and occupying York, later renamed Toronto. Much to the anger of Canadians, the Americans burned down the governor's residence and the buildings of the Legislative Assembly. In late 1813, the Americans attempted to win control of the St. Lawrence River by breaking the supply line of the Canadas. They were unsuccessful. Approximately 4,000 American soldiers advanced along the Chateauguay River near Montreal. On October 26, French-Canadian soldiers ambushed the Americans at a ford in the river. There were only 800 French-Canadian soldiers, but the outnumbered French whooped, shout, shouted, and blew their bugles to give the impression of a much larger force. After a skirmish, the American commander gave up the fight and withdrew. On November 11, Another American force on its way to attack Montreal lost the battle at Chrysler's farm near uh, west, west of Cornwall. The battle was the last American attempt to capture Montreal. In the final days of 1813, Indians burned down Buffalo, New York. After almost two years of fighting, it appeared that the Americans could not ca conquer Canada. With the Napoleonic War winding down, the British were in a better position to send reinforcements to North America. While Americans controlled Lake Erie, 
the British were in control of Lake Ontario. The Americans won a battle at Chippewa near Niagara in July 1814, but three weeks later, the Americans withdrew after another battle, losing Fort Erie to the British. In August, the British successfully landed ships near Washington. On August 24th, President Madison fled with the rest of the government as British soldiers entered the capital city. Except for the patent office, the British burned all the government buildings as revenge for the burning of York. The executive mansion was scorched and later whitewashed and since referred to as the White House. Staying only two days in Washington, the British set out to attack the city of Baltimore, the third largest city in America. In the previous year, the Americans had done much defensive work to protect the city. Fort McHenry was Baltimore's main defense. On September 14th, after three days of little military progress, the British withdrew from Baltimore. From this battle, Francis Scott Key wrote a poem called The Defense of McHenry that later became the lyrics of the American national anthem, the Star Spangled Banner. Also in September, the Americans were victorious at the Battle of Plattsburgh in New York, defeating a larger force led by Sir George Prevost. Unaware of any results of the peace conference taking place in Europe, the British landed near Nor New Orleans in December but they were soundly defeated on January the 8th, 1815, by a force led by General Andrew Jackson. This British disaster occurred 13 days after the signing of the Treaty of Ghent. The war had ended in stalemate. The treaty signed in Ghent, Belgium, was a return to the status quo. There was no territorial concessions. Overall, the Canadian people likely gained the most. They were in a more secure position militarily and conceptually. The war demonstrated that an American attempt to conquer the Canadas was unlikely to happen. The British sea power remained impressive and the British bolstered their forts in British North America. More than before, Canadians embraced the idea of independence from the United States. It became clear to both the Americans and British that most Canadians had no desire to join the United States. The majority of Canadians were farmers and they wanted to be left alone to raise their families something most American farmers could appreciate. The elites living in the several Canadian urban centers valued British tradition, and they were uneasy with the political thinking coming out of Washington. Overall, the war revived anti-Americanism, and thus there was a greater spirit of Can Canadian unity. Indeed, historians point to the War of 1812 as representing the first story building of Canadian nationalism. Thank you.